will go. It's not too surprising. So, let's see. We have to ask ourselves the question, how could this happen? How could an Israelite family create a graven image? How could a person like Micah make his own tabernacle? How could he appoint his son as priest? I struggled with that at first, and then I came to the conclusion, you know, the next verse gives us the clue to that. I, I think when the author was writing this book, he tells this tale and he thinks, you know, people are going to say, how in the world could they depart so far from God? And so he says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what? As he saw fit. <laughs> Everyone did as he saw fit. You see, when there's no underlying authority, just about anything goes. In a sense, a person can become the ruler of the world if there is no overlying authority. In a sense, a person can say, well, I'm going to live the way I want to, I'm going to do what I want to, and it doesn't matter. They don't need God anymore. By the way, just as an aside, Israel did have a king at that time. You may remember Gideon, the one who, uh, the 300 men, was able to destroy the Midianites. After that great battle, the people came to him and said, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you've saved us out of the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. Who will rule? The Lord will rule over you. Yes, the Lord will rule over you. A little book that I picked up by Roy Gain, God's Faulty Heroes. It is not that God was one unwilling to be king, but that the Israelites were not willing to acknowledge him. The kingship of God is of crucial significance for us today. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we ask God to rule in our present lives. Wow. Do we ask God to rule? Do we want him to be the ruler? You see, the, the normal, natural tendency is for me to want to rule myself. I do like being the ruler of the world. But in reality, when I do that, what am I doing to God? Pushing him out of my life, shoving him aside, putting him away. But there's more to the story of Micah than that. There was a young Levite. Levite is a priest, right? He's walking from Judah. He walks into the hill country of Ephraim. And where does he end up? But at the home of Micah. And Micah, in good fashion, comes out and greets him and gets acquainted with him. And he says, who are you? What are you doing? And all the rest. Imagine Micah's surprise when he finds out, number one, he's a priest. Number two, he's looking for a job. And bingo, Micah says, wow, have I ever got a job for you? And so it is that he offers him room and board and clothing and a small stipend. And after, Micah, after the Levite agrees to the terms, Micah installs him as a priest and considers him like a son. And Micah sits down and he says, Wow, the Lord has really blessed me now. Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. There's another version that translates that the Lord will prosper me. The Lord will give me all the things I want now because He has given me this priest. All of this was done without regard for what God had said to them. He just simply did this and took it on His own to do it and was doing it His way. Again from the book by Roy Gain. They are revealing words. The motivation for Micah's worship was self-serving and materialistic. Basically no different from the motivation behind Baal worship. The concern of the people was thus materialism, not spiritual and moral goodness. Micah was no different, except that he worshipped the Lord. He regarded the Lord in the same way as if he were Baal. I read that and I said, wow, that is a problem. You see, there's a danger of us following a similar pattern, of me following a similar pattern. And so I have to ask myself some questions. What is my motivation for attending worship services? You know, I've said it myself. I might as well not have gone to worship today because I didn't get anything out of it. You ever thought that or said that? Yeah. But let me ask you a question. When you go to worship, who is the audience? Huh? God is the audience, isn't he? 
And if God is the audience, who is it that's supposed to be blessed by the worship service? Ooh, God. Now that doesn't mean we don't go to worship because we have some needs that need to be met. It doesn't mean that at all. But at a fundamental level, I ask myself, do I go to worship in order to feel good, or do I go in order to connect with the heart and mind of God? That's what I want to do. I think that's what we've done today in this place. Is our worship and our music self-centered or God-centered? And that's not a, a question that I ask to a contemporary church. I ask it of any church. It doesn't matter. Every one of us have to ask ourselves, are the things that we do helping us to connect with God? Why do I tithe? Why do I give offerings? Do I do it in order to manipulate God into doing what I want and what I need? And do I hear about blessings if I do, so that's my motivation? Or is it because I love Him? Why do I pray? Do I want to twist his arm? Do I want to get him to do something for me that um, he wouldn't otherwise do? You see, once we start down the road of have it your way, and of everyone doing as they see fit, of all of us doing things the way we want to, where does it really lead? Well, I thought about that a bit. You know, if there is no parental authority in our homes and, in our ch and for our children, where does it lead? To anarchy, unhappiness, everybody at everybody else's throats? What if there's no pastoral teaching authority in the church? Everyone having it their way, doing as they see fit. Everyone saying, well, I don't, I, I don't know what the Bible says, but here's how I think, here's how I believe, here's what I want to do. There's no government authority, and I'm not a real fan of the government necessarily, but uh, if there's no authority in the government, then we can do whatever we want. I can drive down the wrong side of the road. I can come and take stuff out of your house. If I can get away with it, it's mine. I'll just take it. Hmm? Whoa. But you can do the same to me, right? So that doesn't work too good. But anyway, you can see what happens if we don't have it, if we do it that way. Have it your way leads to rationalization. It's a big word, but I like it. To be rational is to make sense, to have a logical path to follow. Rationalization is a form of human-centered human reasoning that has been around for a long time and is justified at every step because it looks and it feels good. A couple of years ago, I read a biography of Ben Franklin, one of the founders of the United States. Quite an interesting guy, real character to get to know. And as I read through it, something in his early life caught my attention. It seems that in his early adult life, Franklin became a vegetarian. And he became a vegetarian probably a little bit on moral reasons or health reasons, but mostly on monetary reasons because he was dirt poor and it was cheaper to eat vegetables than to eat meat. And so he became a vegetarian. Then the author of the book tells this story. During his voyage from Boston to New York, when his boat lay becalmed off Block Island, the crew caught and cooked some cod. Franklin at first refused any until the aroma from the frying pan became too enticing. With all self-awareness, he later recalled what happened. And Franklin says, I balanced, I balanced some time between principle and inclination. You know, let's see. This is what's right. This is what I'd like to do. I balanced some time between those two until I recollected that when the fish were opened, I saw smaller fish taken out of their stomachs. Then thought I, if you can eat one another, I don't see why I may not eat you. So I dined on cod very heartily, and have since continued to eat as other people, returning only now and then, occasionally to a vegetable diet. From this he drew a wry, perhaps even cynical lesson that he expressed as a maxim. Put that up on the screen for me. So convenient a thing it is to be a reasonable creature, since it enables one to find or make a reason for everything one has a mind to do. I see that in our world today. I see a lot of that in the world that I live in today. And I guess that's what makes me feel like the world that I live in.